Welcome to the 2021 Frederick W. Gowdy presentation and distinguished lecture on typography. We are here to honor this year's recipient, Louise Feely. My name is Peter Byrne, and I'm the director of the School of Design in the College of Art and Design at RIT. Welcome, and thank you all for joining us. I would like to also thank the Gowdy Award Selection Committee, Janine Bushy, Lori Frere, Amelia Fontenelle, Stephen Galbraith, and Paul Lina Garces Reed for all their contributions to make this event happen. Thank you to our captioner, Kataboud, our technical support person, Connor Makrowitz, and all at RIT, again, who helped make this event possible. Thank you all. Some housekeeping before we get going. Uh, after Louise's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. You may enter questions via the Q&A feature window in Zoom, and I will moderate the questions. And you may also access uh, captions via the closed captioning CC control panel at the bottom of the Zoom window. The Frederick W. Gowdy Award and Lecture were established in 1969 by funds donated to Rochester Institute of Technology by the Mary Flagler Carey Charitable Trust in memory of her late husband, Melbert B. Carey Jr., a typographer, type importer, fine printer, book collector, and president of AIGA. The award was named after the distinguished American type designer, Frederick W. Gowdy, a friend and business associate of Melbert B. Carey. The annual Frederick W. Gowdy Award is given to an outstanding practitioner in the field of typography. The person selected delivers the Gowdy lecture and meets with students in class and in groups, providing an opportunity for informal contact with a distinguished graphic arts figure. Uh, yesterday, um, Louise Feely visited with uh, students from Professor Lori Frere's packaging design class to get feedback on their projects. Uh, they were inspired by Louise's prompt, good design makes a product taste better. And it was a um, fantastic um, display and presentation of work by students and really great and informative uh, feedback uh, from Louise. So thank you, Louise. Thank you, students. And thank you, Lori. Gaudi Award recipients have been among the most honored and admired figures in the typographic arts. Three have received MacArthur Prize Fellowships. Four have received the AIG Medal, now five. Nine have received the Type Designer Club Medal, now 10. And four have received the Mainz Gutenberg Award. And some of the nominees have included first nominee Herman Zopf, and Charles Bigelow and Chris Holmes, Matthew Carter, and Kate Claire Van Vliet. RIT is honored to present the 33rd Frederick W. Gowdy Award for Typographic Excellence to Louise Feely. Louise will be joining this distinguished list. Louise Feely worked as a senior designer for Herb Lubolin and was art director of Pantheon Books for 11 years, where she designed close to 2,000 book jackets. In 1989, she opened Louise Feely Limited, a design studio specializing in food, type, and all things Italian. Feely is author of Elegantissima, Grafica della Strada, Graphique della Rue, Graphica delle Rambe, The Conoscenti's Guide to Florence, and Italian Isimo, and co-author with Stephen Heller of over 25 books on graphic design. A member of the Art Directors Hall of Fame, she has also received medals for lifetime achievement from the AIGA, the Type Directors Club. She has taught design and typography at School of Visual Arts in New York and Rome for over 30 years and has designed typefaces, Mardell, Montecatini, and Marseille. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Louise Feely. Welcome Louise and congratulations. And you're on you're on mute, Louise. Sorry. Thank you, Peter. For a designer to be mentioned in the same sentence with Frederick W. Gowdy is an honor in itself. But to be included with such luminaries as Herman Zoff. Bradbury Thompson, Matthew Carter, and Ed Bengat is inspiring. 
How could I have known when I was four years old and surreptitiously carving letter forms into the wall above my bed at night that this could lead to a career in typography? Then again, I was four years old. What was typography? In 1969, when the first Gaudi Award was given, I was in high school teaching myself calligraphy so that I could make illuminated manuscripts of Bob Dylan lyrics to sell to classmates. I had a marketable skill. Graphic design had not yet found its way into the general vocabulary. It was known instead by the very unsexy term commercial art. I enrolled at Skidmore College, where if you couldn't paint, you were labeled graphically oriented. We were sent into the marshes to find reeds to use for lettering. I printed books on a letterpress. And my senior project was a completely hand-lettered Italian cookbook with my mother's recipes. All during this time, I was passionate about graphic design and desperate to find female role models. There were none. Since that time, I have made it my mission to mentor as many female designers as I can to ensure that in my lifetime, I'll see a greater representation of women receiving awards as prestigious as this one. And thank you, Gudrun Zoff von Hesse, Edna Bielensen, Chris Holmes, and Claire von Vliet for leading the way. I am now female number five in the lineup. For this distinctive honor, I would like to offer my thanks to RIT, especially Peter Byrne, my family, Stephen Heller and Nicholas Heller, and all of the teachers, employers, clients, staff, and students who have taught me so much over the course of my career. I'm grateful to everyone who has helped me reach that goal and stay there in spite of the fact that I still do not design on a computer. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And uh, a reminder, um, after the presentation, um, we'll be in the Q&A session, and you may enter questions via the Q&A feature and window in Zoom, and I will moderate those questions. Okay. Okay, here we go. When I was 16 years old, I took my first trip to Italy with my parents who were going back for the first time since they had left to come to America, something I never ever forgave them for. It was then that I discovered typography like this that made me wanna become a graphic designer. And it prompted me to collect beautiful specimens of Italian and French typography which inspired me on a daily basis when I was art director of Pantheon Books. And when I first started at Pantheon, it was a time in book publishing when everyone seemed to think the type on covers had to be big and vulgar. I was determined to prove that you didn't have to shout to capture someone's attention. And this cover that I did for the lover is probably the best example of that. Whenever I would design a cover, I did everything I could to avoid using standard typefaces. Instead, I would take a tracing pad, draw a five and a half by eight and a half rectangle, and then take the title of the book and write it over and over again, page after page after page, letting the words speak to me and fill the rectangle. And it would go from an amorphous jumble of letters to something more precise, which was a letter form that didn't exist. So I would have to figure out how to create it. Without realizing it, this is how I learned to design logotypes. So after 11 years of designing thousands of book jackets, it seemed like as good a time as any to start my own studio, where I learned the importance of having your own personal projects. It's the only way to grow as a designer and find your own voice. So I started with what was closest to my heart, Italian Art Deco. And this became a series of books on Art Deco graphic design that I did with my prolific husband, Stephen Heller with highly distinctive covers because I had two rules. We would always put a woman on the cover. And even more importantly, we would always design a font for exclusive use in the book based on a type treatment from one of the images inside the book. And the series did very well and eventually drifted into remainder purgatory as often happens, which 
After which we came out with a hardcover edition, Eurodeco, with selections from each of the books except American, and yet another new type treatment. And after years of designing the outsides of books, it was time to explore the interiors. But there was a, one aspect of book design that always really irked me, and that was the copyright page. This is one of the first type treatments that a reader sees in a book. It's usually on page four. And it's all of this dreadfully dull information, legal information, that has to be set line for line exactly as it's given, or so they said. So one day I was working on a gardening book and I set the copyright page in centered lines and I looked at it and thought, well, with a few little changes, this could look like a tree. So I showed it to my son who was two years old at the time and he got it, so I figured I was home free. But um, the copy editor was apoplectic at the idea of this typographic blasphemy. It's never been done, she said. Is, is that a reason not to do something? So I showed historical reference since I certainly wasn't the first designer to ever contour type. And the answer was still no. Finally, I got the publisher on my side and won my case. So with one of these under my belt, it made it much easier to convince the next publisher who tried to say no. This was a book of poems to Edward Lear. A rather odd book called You Can't Be Too Careful by an Englishman who had collected newspaper clippings of strange ways that people had died. A pair of teeth. This was a collaboration with Art Spiegelman called Wild Party. A guide to the best tea shops in the UK. Lost Words of Love, Writing New York. And I'd always wanted to build the Eiffel Tower out of type and I got to do it twice. This was for the historic shops and restaurants of Paris. And then later I did it for my book of photographs of Paris signs. A book of photographs of the Twin Towers. And a book of photographs of volcanoes which is probably the, the main reason why I decided to do this book. A guide to the artisan shops of Florence, Cuban Deco, and a series of cookbooks, one on chilies and one on beans. And this is a baking book for my client, Sarah Beth. followed by her book on breakfast and brunch. This was also blinded Boston to the, the case. And this was for a monograph of my work, Elegantissima. So remember that it only takes one person to say yes, and that can make all the difference. If it weren't for the, that one publisher, I wouldn't be showing these to you today. Every time I see her, I thank her for what she did. I just saw her on Sunday and I did. Next, I embraced the curious world of restaurants and quickly learned that in New York City, this is the number one business most likely to fail. But on the other hand, I always had a table until the restaurant closed, of course. I found myself designing logos for eateries with unpronounceable French names owned by people who were neither French nor could they even speak French. So the branding, especially the type, had to work miracles. This logo for a spas was inspired by an old French sign painter's manual that I have in my collection. I wanted the logo to look like a classic Parisian hand-painted sign. So I actually talked the client into letting me have an enamel sign made for the restaurant. And when the place closed, I took the sign to my studio. Metro Grill is in the Hotel Metro, thus the uninspired default name. And in these preliminary sketches, I was intrigued by the realization that not only did Metro at Grill have the same number of letters, but they had a shared R. Although eventually I decided that the backward and forward italic treatment of the typography offered more potential. Since the restaurant is located in New York's garment district, I opted to have the logo made into an actual stitched clothing label. Minimum quantity, 5,000. So we use the extra labels on the menus along with remnants from the restaurant's upholstery fabric. 
Metrazor was located on the mezzanine of Grand Central Terminal, now home to an Apple store. The restaurant was named after a train long, uh, trade line along the French Riviera. So I decided to make the business card into a luggage tag. And I try to use letterpress whenever I do branding for restaurants to communicate appetite appeal. And letterpress on both sides of the card was the easy part. Getting someone to add a hole and a string was nearly impossible. Artisanal was a French bistro specializing in cheese. So the idea was to make the logo look like a cheese label. By the time we got to the third iteration down here, you can see that they had already changed the spelling of the name. And while most cheese labels are round, this was really too long a, a name to fit comfortably around the circle. So we opted for an oval shape. And then this is the business card, die cut into an oval on extra thick colored stock, which made some diners think that it should be used as a drink coaster. Those are the same people who think nothing of using my, one of my prized matchbooks to keep the table from being wobbly. Another restaurant with a default name, 92. Can anybody guess what street it was located on? It's not so easy to create a logo out of a two digit number, but when I was taking the subway uptown to look at the construction site for the first time, I found myself paying extra close attention to the subway mosaics. So I went back with my camera and I photographed every nine and every two on the east side and the west side. And with the wizardry of Photoshop, the brand for 92 was created. Now, outside of New York, like maybe in Rochester, you wouldn't be expected to know that this is a visual metaphor for the New York City subway system. But there are even some New Yorkers who don't know that that 92nd Street is not an actual stop. But after working on this for as long as I did, I became convinced that there actually was a 92nd Street stop. Then I looked at the files and saw that there was an, an outline layer, and I saw that we had our children's menu. So this was given to every kid in the restaurant with a red, yellow, and green crayon. The client was very happy. He said, this will keep them busy for a long, long time. So the original name of this restaurant was Italienne, which is the French word for Italian because it was both cuisines, Southern French and Northern Italian. And this is what we first presented. Whenever I start designing a logo, I make certain automatic decisions based on the name. With a name this long, it's clear that it had to be somewhat condensed, or I could have used a script if the name was pronounceable, but not in this case. So the client selected the last one. Of course, it's the most condensed. And they requested these colors, even though we had provided alternate color options, which I liked better. A year later, they decided to change the name of the restaurant, adding Trattoria. This time, we chose the colors. So one day, two clients came to me and said that they wanted to open a restaurant that would feel like a seafood shack that you would stumble onto while you're walking along the beach in New England, except that you are in the East Village of New York City. I would never dream of hyphenating a word in a logo. But this was the time to break all the rules, and we did. And later, when they opened their sister restaurant, Mermaid Oyster Bar, we flipped her and put a pearl choker around her neck. The lettering was all drawn with a mouse. These are the backs of the business card. And then Pizzeria Sirinetta opened next door. And we had to determine a way to hide her breasts because Sirenetta is a little mermaid. We also didn't want anyone to think that this was a place making seafood pizzas. So I thought that making the logo into a tomato can label was a great idea. The clients did not. So instead we covered her with a rolling pin and an apron and with a double hyphenation this time. I've always been fascinated by metal strip signage from Spain, which was the inspiration for Chiquito, a Basque restaurant in Manhattan. And I learned an important lesson from this logo that I 
recommend. Not being familiar with the language, I had thought I should check over the spelling just before the client presentation. And sure enough, I found that we that each of the hand lettered logos that we were about to show had two transposed letters. Instead of Chiquito, we had Chitico. That's what happens when you start sketching and you go from one rough sketch to another. They, they can morph into another letter. So this was not a recommended way to impress a client. These were the other options, which were all reworked at the last moment, just before the presentation. And what would this type from our French note cards have to do with a pizzeria, you might ask? The clients at the Santa Barbara restaurant were interested in pursuing two visual directions. One was a protea, which is this tropical flower here. And the second was Mediterranean citrus, where I got a chance to use my font Montecatini, which had just been released. After some deliberation, the Protea version was chosen. Although we were asked to change the tomato red, which seemed like an obvious color to use, to match the blue-green background of the citrus version. And Pearl was the most was the first authentic oyster bar in New York City which chef owner Rebe Rebecca Charles had been running for 15 years with no logo, just this hanging sign that her sign maker had done based on Rebecca's mother's speedball lettering book from the 1940s. Using a style she selected called Stunt Roman, which is better left forgotten. So I decided to keep the logo in black and white and in the same dimensions as the original sign, but make it look like it had been crafted by a better than average sign painter. Pearl is a really good example of why I prefer to work with small businesses, which you may have already noticed. A few minutes into our first meeting, Rebecca and I discovered that not only did we live in the same neighborhood, but for years we had been peering into each other's bedroom. So it's so New York. That night, I went home and left her a message in the window, a tradition which continued every year on her birthday. At some point, my landlord cut down our shared tree to Rebecca's great distress. Shortly after that, my landlord passed away unexpectedly, and Steve and I had to sadly take our leave. After our last night in the apartment, I left one final sign in the window. For Claudette, a Provençal restaurant on Fifth Avenue, the logo exploration began by referencing French scripts from my 1930s button card collection. And along the way, the clients decided that they wanted a wrought iron sign. And how often does that happen? So we decided to design a logo that could be crafted out of metal. And the sign came out so well that I decided to order another one to include in my retrospective exhibition. When the exhibit came down, I brought the sign to my studio. And these are two esteemed women chefs, Jody Williams and Rita Sodi, who joined forces to open Via Carota, named after the street that Rita grew up on in Tuscany, Via della Carota or Carrot Street. They made it quite clear from the start that they had absolutely no interest in seeing either a carrot or a street sign in the logo. I could do without the carrot, but for me, the street sign was a real missed opportunity. This is my version of a mood board. My conference table at the studio covered with Italian reference for our initial meeting. Books, orange wrappers, monograms, packaging, and signage, et cetera. So we talked about possible chive treatments, a monogram, a crown, an unusual shape for the business card. It was clear that Rita's taste was more minimal than Jody's, and I had to keep that in mind as I chose these directions to work with. I showed samples of monograms uh, in a scrapbook that I have from the late 1800s. And we flipped through my collection of labels. They like this one for the shape, as well as the embossed dots along the edge. So by the end of the meeting, we had something to work with, two styles of typography, a shape, a monogram, and a possible engraving. 
So we agreed to meet again at the presentation for the presentation at my studio in a month. So when we met for the presentation, to everyone's surprise, I began by showing the logo as a classic Florence street sign. Only because it was a stepping stone to the first presentation, a fantasy street sign, taking elements of a normal street sign and elevating it, more elegant and refined for Rita's taste, but with a playful quality for Jody. Next, the monogram option, even though this was meant to be a presentation for the logo only, I'm always curious about how these options could translate to other components, like a tray, since it fits so well in a circle. And it's much more effective to present an idea as a physical object rather than a PDF. The monogram was followed by my preferred option, referencing letter forms from Italian Art Nouveau or Stile Liberty, often found in the hand-lettered posters of that period. The clients opted for this design, although some of the letter forms were too ornate for their tastes. So the curl in the C and the crossbar of the A had to be more restrained. Claudette had made us relax the curl of their C as well. I don't know why. And from there, we did the matches, coasters with a monogram, and the oversized menus, which fit perfectly to the back pocket once meant to hold a Bible of the chapel chairs that were ordered from England. Although Via Carota does not take reservations, it is well worth the wait, especially now that the owners have opened Tizzolino, a very tiny, very authentic Italian bar cafe right across the street, which is an ideal way to pass the time waiting for a table at the restaurant. So the logo is meant to be a distant cousin of Via Carota, and we kept the same shape and color, but stretched it horizontally to accommodate the longer name. Although I'm always looking for an opportunity to use these up and down quotes that I see very often in Italy, they were not favored in this instance. Although I did find a way to use them later on, which you'll see. The brand is everywhere in this tiny space, die cut business cards, espresso cups from Italy, coasters printed with items from the drink menu, a patterned wrapper for Pinguino, which is a, a chocolate covered gelato. Cocktail doilies. And of course, the mosaic monogram on the floor to greet you as you enter. And this restaurant is owned by chef Francesco Butoni of pasta royalty. The logo for his Italian trattoria was created in my studio's kitchen where we tried boiling bucatini, linguine, spaghetti at all, all at different cooking times to find the most suitable for a script iteration. Bucatini was the winner. And I don't know if any of you know this, but during the pandemic, there was a huge shortage of bucatini that everyone was talking about. Fortunately, we did this logo just before the lockdown. And somehow along this, uh, along this whole episode, uh, Bucatini is always the winner became a hashtag. And although the client had originally requested blue for the logo since most pasta packaging is blue, it was later changed to red and with a die cut business card. So Bettina changed from red to blue and Jobata from blue to red, go figure. Especially when it is very well known in this business that blue is not a food color. Here's the matchbook with a pasta chart inside that we invented. And this is their sign when it isn't snowing. They're upstate New York. This is a conceit that I have been attempting to use for years. I think maybe it's time to retire it now that we've gotten to 20 years. Since 2001, I've been trying to sell a restaurant on this idea, but so far, no takers. For the Harrison, they thought this was too Italian. This was to introduce the Friuli region of Italy to New York City, but for them, it wasn't New York enough. A nice Z, but no thank you. A competition for a new Italian restaurant inside of a cinema, the chef lost the contest. 
Sfolia is a restaurant specializing in handmade pasta, which was perfect, but instead we designed a better logo option. Same thing for Via Carota. And the same for Giobatta, although they later had buyer's remorse and wanted to change from Bucatini to the fork. And I said, no. When I was in Milan years ago, researching the Italian Art Deco book, I came across this trove of pasticceria papers from the 1930s, beautifully patterned wax papers, all hand lettered to wrap pastries in the shops. This is what made me decide to shift my focus to include packaging. One of my first clients was Bella Cucina, and in spite of their name, they are not Italian, but they're from Atlanta. Unfortunately, they are not afraid of a little hand labor, which is what all designers want to hear. And a lot of what we do in food package design is about makeovers. When a food producer starts a business, they rarely have the know-how or the budget to hire a real designer. And then five or 10 or even 25 years later, if they're still in business, they'll realize that they've reached a point where the quality of their graphics doesn't measure up to the quality of their product. And that's when they usually call me. I love makeovers because it gives me enormous satisfaction to clean up after someone else's mess. And I've also come to realize that you can change a lot as long as you keep one or two key elements. Sarah Beth had been in business for 25 years when she decided on a change. I took one look at this label and I knew that the printer had been designing it. It, it reeked of Microsoft Word. Why else would it say under Sarah Beth, spread the word in italics, quotes, underscored, and in red, and it means nothing. So that was the first thing to go. But she was apprehensive, understandably. And I explained that we would keep the same jar, we keep the same oval, so she wouldn't have to pay for a new die, and keep her name in upper and lower case, and then we would just upgrade everything else. So it's better typography, better illustration. We changed Mason, uh, that's embossed at the top, to Sarah Betts, um, and we did a, a custom lid. But also I was very adamant that the paper stock had to be brighter because what she had looked really dingy because it was not opaque enough. So even though her regular customers kept reaching for the same jar every week and might not have noticed the change, they suddenly had a higher regard for the product, which is the aim of a makeover. So this was carried over to her other products, hot chocolate, coffee, coffee cups for the, um, the bakery, and for her restaurants in Japan, a fan. With Tate's, we kept the color sort of, and the, recti the rectangle sort of, and it, it, we changed everything else. The boxes were designed to reference milk cartons. The, then the company was sold for $100 million and they changed the packaging. American Spoon has also been making jam for 25 years, although this was a family business in Northern Michigan. And for them, it's all about the fruit. If the, they have a personal relationship with all of their growers. So if the black raspberry crop isn't good one year, they just won't make the jam. So I really wanted to communicate that human interaction in the logo and commissioned my wood engraver to do this image on the right, which is used on printed on their lids. And then I hired a second illustrator to do all these botanical images for the labels. I find it very interesting that it took two British illustrators to convey this very American brand. Everyone should have a gelato client. A Sicilian diamond cutter came to New York but missed his hometown gelato and so decided to make his own, which I can honestly say is the best in New York. Although when I met him, and I saw his logo, I told him I would never, ever walk into a gelateria with a logo like that. He listened. The lettering and design was influenced by those pasticceria papers in my collection. And as part of the arrangement, there is always gelato available, which is a really good way to keep clients and staff happy. In New York, the branding is everywhere. The carts are on the High Line and at the Guggenheim Museum. And they even have a 
vintage Fiat Cinquecento that they brought over from Sicily. And yes, the three of us were actually inside that car for this picture. The only thing better than having a gelato client is having two. The original, the original packaging for this company was laughable, but with a new container and classical typography, it was taken a little more seriously. It was this makeover that taught me two important lessons. One, a good package design can actually make a product taste better. And two, a bad name can seem less bad when it has a good logo. I tried to talk them out of this name, but they, they wouldn't budge. And gelato fiasco means nothing in either language. This is the freezer on a typical day in the studio. Whenever I have a client presentation, I schedule it for the afternoon in my studio. I serve gelato first, and then I show the work. I find that if they aren't interested in gelato, they shouldn't be my client. And this is an example of before and after and after. Not too many New Yorkers know what a salumeria is. It's a shop selling pork products or salumi. So it was essential to include a pig in the logo design to communicate the meaning to an uninformed public. The client was offended by the playfulness of the pig. So our logos in the end were not accepted. However, I was approached by a restaurant in Texas, which happened to be another Salumeria. They used this version, but unfortunately they closed in less than a year. After which a whistleblower in New Jersey alerted me about this logo, which the restaurant owner had bought online from a designer in India for $39. A blog called Logo Thief had a headline that read, Marie's Deli gets a Louise Feely for a steal. Marie's agreed to cease and desist. There, and there's always something good to drink in the studio as well. All of these wines were imported from Italy. So I decided to design the labels as mini posters that reference Italian typography from the early 1900s. And Sfida on the left, is an aptly named wine. It means challenge in Italian, which is exactly what it was to design this label, which had to be done in a very specific size and shape with all that type. And every now and then we'll do something that's not food related, which isn't nearly as much fun. This was a monogram for Tiffany, which needed to be used as small as the winder of a man's watch or as large as for a construction shed. And there were several choices for the configuration, TC, TCO, T ampersand, anything. So they ended up choosing the second one from the right, although we had to make it bolder, which is why I don't like to work with big companies. Two logos for, two, for publishing companies. This is a division of HarperCollins, and this is the public, publishing arm of Disney. Disney studios are located on Hyperion Avenue in Burbank and Hyperion is a type of daylily. I'm sure everybody's gotten an invitation from Paperless Post. And I'm sure every woman is wearing hanky panky right now. With a name that comes with built in cute, there is no need to do anything more than to link the K's. And these are two hosiery companies importing yarns from Italy. I suggested that instead of using paper bands that every other sock maker uses to opt for an, a woven label. After all, I had a source for that. It costs a little bit more, but it was worth it for all the attention that the brand got as a result. And I had the opportunity to use this type style from Italian and Spanish deco letter forms. This was for my dentist who has a very fancy office on Madison Avenue, which offers state-of-the-art equipment and a complimentary foot massage with every visit. And this was for Crane Paper Company. The idea of the nesting seas was in reference to the Housatonic River where the Crane Paper Mill is located. I've taught at the School of Visual Arts for over 30 years and have had the opportunity along with many talented colleagues to contribute to the school's distinctive brand. Every year the school publishes a senior library. It's a book that showcases all the work of the graduating 
uh, graphic design majors, which a different instructor is invited to design every year. So when it was my turn, I decided to make it into a beautiful box of chocolates. When you open the box, it seems like an actual box of chocolates, but I fooled a lot of people. Many students were very disappointed when they discovered that inside the box was nothing more than a book. And these posters were for our annual master's workshop in typography in Italy, which ran for 10 years and which gave me a perfect excuse to travel there every year. The first years were held in both Venice and Rome and then finally just Rome, which was a lot easier for the poster design. To catch someone's attention legally on the New York City sub subway system is no easy feat. The School of Visual Arts is known for its long history of posters in the subways. And when I was invited to design one, I decided right away to do it as a mosaic. Given that we had already done Restaurant 92, I thought, well, we know how to do that. Why, but what I didn't take into account was that a two digit number is a lot easier to make than a 13 word poster. My staff will never forgive me for the tortuous month they spent creating this poster in Photoshop tile by tile. And by the end, we all agreed that it probably would have been easier to have made it out of real mosaic tile. It was underground for a two month run and then came above ground to the side of the building as a 38 foot blow up. And this is the main SVA building. So just by luck, not only did the yellow arrow point to the school, but it also points to my studio, which is right over here. The next subway poster was due to come out in April. And after a brutal winter, I knew that everyone would be craving a big dose of spring. So I made it into a big seed package, burying the SVA logo right here. When I was asked to design a third poster, I knew that I should start with the logo this time, given that it is such a nuisance to work with. What would the logo look good stamped into? How about chocolate? So the poster was, was done as a chocolate bar wrapper. And having collected many Italian pencil boxes over the years, I decided to create my own double-sided perfetto pencils in red and black with those up and down quote marks that I finally got to use. Colored pencils called Tutti Frutti and metallic pencils Brillante. For over 30 years, I've been traveling to Italy in search of signs. Each time I go, I choose a different city that I've never visited before, going up and down every street in search of new typographic gems like these. I started with 35 millimeter slides and then moved up to point and shoot prints and then finally digital. And these had never been meant for anything more than my own reference and enjoyment, but as the digital photography got better and better, and as my favorite signs began to disappear at an alarming rate, I felt a sense of urgency to put the images in a book before they were gone forever. I went back to as many cities as I could to reshoot, and I never left home without my secret weapon. And this is not a selfie stick, it's a telescoping pole, something that I had always wanted in life, an extra three feet of height. This is in Venice with a truncated version of the telescoping pole. I started shooting as soon as I arrived, discovering that all of these mosaic signs on, on the pavement were filthy. So I came back the next day with a box of baby wipes, whatever it takes. For the signs that were no longer there, we relied on Photoshop. And I was so happy to have been able to do this book. And most surprising thing about it was the response from the Italian press. Everyone basically said the same thing. We walk by these signs every day and without noticing anything. And it took an American to make us appreciate them. Before I had even finished the Italian book, I had started on the next. Paris, there was no time to lose in the race to preserve a type legacy. I went back with the same telescoping pole and I figured this one would be so much easier instead of a whole country, it was just one city. 
but it's a huge city with signage that was disappearing rapidly, especially signs like these in neon script. The last chapter of the book is called Sans mots or without words for signs like this one, Au pied du cochon, the pig's foot, and Le chien qui fume, the smoking dog. It was a great inspiration for me when I was designing this logo for Poulet Sans Tête, Chicken Without a Head, a rotisserie restaurant for which we made a blinking neon sign. Next and last stop, Barcelona. From Modernista to Art Deco in mosaics, wrought iron and stained glass. One sign I was especially looking forward to seeing in person was this beautiful script for a photo studio which I had seen only in a book and had never, and had been checking regularly on Google Street View, where I spend a lot of time researching these books before I travel. As soon as I arrived in Barcelona, I literally ran to the location where I found this. I was devastated. I, feel, I felt like I had missed the sign's removal by a matter of minutes and probably had. The next day I was interviewed by a reporter from the Spanish newspaper El País, and I mentioned my tale of woe, which was in turn noted in the story that ran a few days later. And when I came back to New York, I received an email from Angel Lopez, grandson of the original owner. And he said, my family and I were very moved by the article. And if you ever return to Barcelona, we will remount the sign so you can take a picture. So I went back immediately and the whole family came out for the event. I dedicated the book to them. I find it incredibly ironic that it was digital photography that put this family out of business, but allowed me to do the book. And a few years ago, I embarked on something that I swore I would never do, font design. For all the time I've been designing logos, only the letters that are needed are drawn. No punctuation, no numerals, no diacritics, no interest. But when I was invited by Hamilton Woodtype Museum to design a font to be cut out of wood and sold in a digital version as well, I decided to develop an Italian futurist inspired font, which was named Mardell after Hamilton's longtime pantograph operator, Mardell Dubeck, who came out of retirement to cut this typeface, which I was able to witness firsthand at the museum. And these posters were printed in letterpress and are also sold at the museum. That same year, I had a retrospective exhibition at School of Visual Arts where I had to find a way to cover this eyesore of a staircase. It merely required coming up with 12 pasta names of equal length, not a problem. And next came Montecatini, where I was again inspired by lettering from Stile Liberty posters in Italy. It's now available in 24 styles and features more than 200 ligatures, which make copy fitting a breeze and monograms too. And this is my team. The soccer club, club of Sevilla decided to use Montecatini for all of their branding. I love the way the numerals look on the back of the jerseys. And Marseille, available in six weights in upper and lower case. For many years, this alphabet was my go-to elegant letter form. I used it for the book jacket for the lover that you saw earlier, and later to announce the opening of my studio and the birth of my son. Finally, I decided to create a font and ultimately a font family for all of my French and Italian needs. And finally, a lot of what you've seen today is from my latest book, part of a Moleskine series on process and inspiration and design, which was the perfect way to pass the time during the lockdown. You could pre-order it now and it will be released on June 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And, You're um, welcome. Yeah. And um, we're in the Q and A right now. And um, first question: um, Would you share your method for designing without a computer? <laughs> I have a lot of tracing pads and a lot of black wing pencils. I love to sketch, 
And I, for me, the sketch is always the soul of the design. I think it's, I think once you have a good sketch, you're lucky if you can turn that into a, a finish that's, that has what the sketch is trying to, to communicate. Um, so that's the way I work. That's what, and you know, when I worked with Herb Lubell and that's what he did all day. He had a huge tracing pad. He was ambidextrous, so sometimes he used both hands to work twice as fast. And I just love to just sit in a deco chair I have that is hard to get out of. So once I sit down in it, I, I like to stay there and I just um, sketch out all kinds of ideas. They can be, they can start out as very rough. And the, the new book shows a lot of sketches, um, which I had kind of forgotten about. I, I did a lot of digging, fortunately, before the lockdown. So I had, I had enough material to work with. But yeah, sketching is the best. W wonderful. And as a wonderful mentor to all women in design, Louise is surprisingly number five, long overdue for the award. The question, what is her favorite number to design? What is your favorite <laughs> number to design? I've never been asked that and I've never thought about it. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, maybe a 12 because I'm born on the 12th. Um, but, um, and if you ask me what my favorite letter is, I don't know what that is either. I can tell you what some of my least favorite letters are. <laughs> Everybody hates J's, but, um, but uh, I'll, let, I'll let you know more about the number if I think of anything. Okay, great, thanks. Have you encountered clients whose ethics conflicted with your own? And if so, how did you approach accepting or declining the, their project? Well, someone made a racist comment in a, uh, in, a, in a meeting that I was in once. It was a preliminary meeting. It's the first time I'd met the client and he came with a little posse of his assistants. And I was so outraged. I was ready to just stand up and tell him to leave. But because he had a group with him and I could see that they were very embarrassed. Um, but, but I guess it was the first time they've heard him talk like this. I just said, I'm sorry, but I'm too busy to work on this project and leave it at that. So I concluded the meeting as quickly as possible. But I, did, I didn't think I, I physically could throw out a person of that size. Thanks. What city would you like to research next? And oh, seen? well, talk to my publisher about that. I proposed um, I proposed a double city because I couldn't really think of one in, that would be enough for a book because I have to take a lot of pictures to fill a book. But I was researching Lisbon and Porto, and I thought that would be a really nice combination. And, and as I said, I spend a lot of time researching these books before I leave, and then I make my own little maps. Um, so I, I have all, I have the, the, my itinerary every day is all planned out. Um, and for Portugal, I did find a lot of interesting typography in the signs, but I proposed it to my publisher and they, they thought that three had been enough. There's a second part to the question. Uh, <laughs> have you thought of focusing on studying typography from non-European cities or non or the non-Roman alphabet? No, <laughs> not yet anyway, we'll see. And did you create, also create the illustrations that come along with your type font? With my type font? There was, there, that was very minimal. There was just sort of an ornament that we had in Montecatini that um, was, was inspired by an ornament we saw on a, uh, Steal a Liberty poster. Great. Now, Louise, you've hired many designers throughout your career who have gone on to enjoy great success. Uh, do you have an instinct for who will achieve huge success on their own when they are working for you? I usually have an instinct uh, as soon as I meet them, and that's why I hire them. If, you know, they need to be passionate about graphic design. And, and when I'm looking at a portfolio, I want to see at least one piece in that portfolio that I wish I had done. 
And that always happens with the people I hire. I, there's always at least one. Great. Um, you started talking about this um, when you uh, um, talked about your um, typeface Mardell. And um, please talk about your design process for Mardell, the typeface you designed for the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum. Well, they asked me to do this, which originally I didn't think I was interested in doing, but the Hamilton Wood Type Museum is impossible to turn down because the two brothers who run it, Bill and Jim Moran, are, are so sweet. So, but, but this sounded intriguing and I thought, well, yeah, I could do something with Italian futurist typography. So I, I started looking through all my reference and there, there were a couple of futurist uh, wood type faces that I, I looked at. And then I just looked at all the hand lettered posters that were, had similar kinds of typography, but more, more creative. And we had never done a font before, so we didn't really know what we were doing, but <laughs> they were very patient about that. So we worked with uh, P22 Type Foundry. We gave them the alphabet as an illustrator file, and then they, they did the rest of it. So thank heavens. <laughs> But it should only be used in red and black, as far as I'm concerned. And what was it like for a woman designer at the beginning of your career? Difficult. Um, the beginning of my career, that's why I, I worked for Her Blue Ballon and for Pantheon, because book publishing is where a lot of women ended up, because they paid so poorly that they hired women. And Her Blue Ballon, had a design studio where he hired, and this, you know, starting in the 60s, he was hiring African Americans and women in large numbers, which was really quite impressive. Um, and then from there, I started my studio, which uh, at that time, because I've had my studio for 32 years, um, at that time was uh, not very easy to do. Just, just naming my studio. I, I knew it was a liability to name it after myself, but in those days it was the pre-Google era and people had to find you in the phone book. That was it. So I couldn't get really creative with it, or I could have called it Feely Associates and try to make it look like I was a big company, but that's not really my style. So I just, I just decided to call it Louise Feely LTD and I just wanted to send a clear message. If you have a problem with my being female, then I have a problem with you as, as my client. End of story. Um, what is the best advice or fond memory you experienced while working with Herb Lubellin? Oh, uh, I have two. Um, one, the first was looking at a Pantone book with Herb, because Herb was colorblind. He was ambidextrous, but he was colorblind. So whenever we were working on colors for a project and he'd flip through the book and he'd say, now let's find a nice red. And he was in the green pages. And I never knew, is this like when you deal with a, you know, I mean, are you supposed to correct him or um, just let him go on his own? But what was interesting is that he, he, um, he knew tonality. So, Pantone 452 was his favorite color because it was like this neutral tan kind of color where you could surprint type or drop it out. And he used that for everything. So I, after I left, I realized how much, how much flexibility I now had being able to use any color in the Pantone book, not just 452 or fake red or green. And he, Herb also used to give me a ride to work every morning because he lived on McDougal Alley in the former studio of Jackson Pollock. McDougal Alley used to be um, servants quarters for the, the fancy houses on Washington Square. So it was a small house that Herb redesigned. And so he lived like right around the corner from me. So he gave me a ride to work every morning. And it took me the longest time to figure out that I shouldn't try to make conversation with him. He's, he was not a morning person. And I kept trying and I, I couldn't do it. But one time, but occasionally he would give me a ride home. Usually, usually we went our separate ways, but on the way home, he, after a full day of work, he was loquacious, you know, and he, his favorite thing was to, was to drive by um, 
stores that had signs in in one of his typefaces used badly, of course, like, you know, Lou Ballin graph using all the slanted A's when you shouldn't do that. So it was amusing. Great, thank you. Um, how much does your family influence your work and inspire you? My family, yeah. my son and my, and my husband. Uh, well, my son is New York Nico. I think a lot of you know about him. He's an incredibly talented filmmaker and has a huge Instagram presence, New York Nico. Um, and he's, he, I think the greatest thing about him is that he's been able to make positive situations out of things that weren't so positive to begin with, like the lockdown. Like he had, he, he contracted COVID like at the very beginning of the lockdown. And then after he got over it, he was trying to come up with ways to um, keep people occupied. Uh, and not depressed about being inside. So he did all kinds of, he did a New York accent contest and got Alec Baldwin to, to uh, participate in it. Um, he, did, he, he, did a, he did a dating service. He's done all kinds of things. And next week he's interviewing the mayoral candidates for mayor of New York. So it's, it's covered all kinds of areas, but everybody knows him. And everybody knows Steve Heller, my husband, who I met because he wrote me a fan letter. He was, he was the art director of the New York Times Book Review, and he used to see my books coming in when I was at Pantheon. So that's how we met. And um, he's, as I said before, he's incredibly prolific, and we love to work together. But he also does a lot of books on his own because he, he just can't help himself. So that's my family. Thank you. What is the most important aspect that a graphic designer needs to hold within themselves in order to find success? Wow. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think about that. I have to think about that one. I guess, I guess on, honesty is probably a good one. Leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, to what level does the language spoken, written, play a role in your type design? Italian versus Spanish versus German versus non-Romanesque letters and languages, uh, Cyrillic, or Arabic, etc. Or does the culture of the locale and brand service and the client play a larger role. Well, could you read that question again? <laughs> I was going to say that after <laughs> I read it. That's a big thought, one. That's a big, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a definitely. big one. Can I just I'll, say I'll, number one or number two? Right. I'll, 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 I'll parse it a bit. That is a big question. To what level does the language spoken slash written play a role in type, in your type design? Okay. Well, I, I have to say that I, I mean, it, it, not talking about my type design, but just like, for example, the signs that attract me that I want to photograph. That's why I, I answered before that I have to, I have to do that in Europe because I've seen beautiful signs, vintage signs here in America, but they're in English. It's just not as interesting, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be in Italian. It could be in another a European language, but those are what appeal to me. And those, that's what would inspire me to turn them into, into uh, a font or some kind of typographic treatment. Thank you. Uh, is a shorter question. Uh, how do you decide what projects to take on? Uh, well, they have to be interesting. I have, to, and I'd like to think that I can do something good with it. And it has to be a client who I think that I can get along with as well as my staff, because a bad client can bring down a, a whole studio, especially if it's a small studio. So I'm always very careful about, about that. Great, thank you. Um, it's graduation time coming around the corner. And You're what right. advice can you give a new graduate? Oh, good luck. 
Well, we're coming out of the pandemic, so that's good timing. I think, um, I think just make your portfolio really represent who you are so that, so that when you show it to someone, they won't be confused. You want, you, you want it to hold together as, as one consistent unit and, and write a good cover letter. And anytime I get a dear sir or a madam letter, it's immediate delete. Um, or when someone writes and says, uh, you know, I, I love your work, especially, and then they list three things because that's what their teachers told them to do, I guess. So that's where honesty comes in again. That's great. And how do you decide what projects to take on? Didn't you ask me that question? <laughs> I might have, we'll, we'll pass on that <laughs> long list. Like I, that. I take it on, I, I take on the ones that interest me and that, and where the client will be someone I want to work with. Great. And in this pandemic, how do you um, run your studio in the new world we're living in? And do you miss um, being in the office? I miss being in the office a lot. I go there once a week just to remember who I was. <laughs> And what the studio was. We've been working remotely, and it's it's been it's gone quite well considering how difficult it is. Um, and we we got we got the book finished, and we're opening a type foundry called Typophily, which should be happening in a couple of months. So we we made good use of the time. I was always busy, but it takes. Most of the time, it takes a lot longer to get things done than it used to. So that's why I'm looking forward to going back to the studio, although I think there's going to be a significant period of adjustment. Oh my god, one of Steve's books just fell off the bookshelf. OK, that's why I have to go back to the studio. Yeah, well, studio speaking. Um, what, you, what would you do differently looking back, and what are you glad you did? I should have learned how to use a computer because that, that became especially clear to me during the pandemic because um, I'm used to just asking my designers all the time, how do I do this? And, and now I've had to figure it out on my own, which it makes me feel like a complete moron. Um, and what am I glad that I did? I'm glad I started my studio. And I wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for my son, Nick. And that's how I always know how old my studio is because they're the same age. Who are your mentors? Steve and Nick. Yeah. Now, what is the most important insight you can give women on balancing between being a mother and running your own business? Oh. Well, you have to tailor the business to what works for you. And it, that's different for everyone. But uh, for me, it was about geography. I've always had my studio very close to home, which was a really good thing, even though I, it's not like I went home every day for lunch or anything like that. But it was just, even if, you know, if I needed a book or something that was in one place and not in the other, I could just run and get it. Or if there was an emergency, but it was mostly, it was mostly just um, trying to keep things running and looking like it, like it was a professional studio. Because um, I know when I first, when my son was first born and I was, I worked at home for the first two years because I had a separate studio in the apartment, but everybody's perception was that I was, you know, sitting at my drawing table, rocking the cradle with my foot while I was working, you know, and that's not how it's done. You, but you just have to, you have to try to arrange it in the best way you can for your own needs, but keep it looking as professional as possible. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how much do you take accessibility into account in your designs, uh, people who are colorblind, dyslexic, et cetera? Oh, that's a tough question. We, we, well, we're becoming much more aware of it and we've had to, we've, we've just started, um, addressing that more. 
because it is it is very important. Uh, here's one. Um, thank you for such a generous presentation. Uh, you're a great inspiration. Uh, would you mind um, telling us about the images on the wall behind you? I knew somebody would ask about that. I'm glad you did. This is a Swiss poster designer named Nicholas Stoeklin, S-T-O-E-C-K-L-I-N. And these were object posters, which um, uh, Bernhard had started um, in Germany. These were from 1940, these are both done in 1941. So it's just the object and that's, and the type on the poster is on the object, which I think is so brilliant. But they make a good backdrop, I think. Although it's always hard to get them to line up correctly without, unless I show you too much of the floor. You don't wanna do that. I, I love that you honored Mardell working at Hamilton. Are there other unsung females that need to be recognized in typography? Oh, that's a hard one. I'm still trying to find out who they all were. I mean, when I looked up the four who preceded me with this award, I didn't realize that Edna Billinson had was uh, Peter Pauper Press, which I always admired, like in in high school. And who knew? So. Um, there, I mean, I'd have to sit down and make a list. I mean, there, there are many that I have known who, like Henrietta Kondak, for example, who was at, at uh, Columbia Records for many, many years, very, very talented. And nobody knows about her. I mean, from that generation, you really would have to promote yourself or nobody would know. Thank you. And how much of your time, I guess, pre-pandemic, do you spend in another country? <laughs> um, well, when I was working on the books, for example, I went starting with the uh, Italian sign book. I took four trips to Italy that for that book, although one of the trips was was already planned because that was our um, master's workshop. So four trips in one year would make me very happy, but it takes a lot of planning and um, it's hard to be away from the studio for that long. But what I did with the um, sign books is that I would always take one of those trips over the Christmas holidays because people are less likely to notice that you're gone. So I would, the, the first, when I did the Italian book, I, um, I had a, uh, what is it, the fellowship, was it called, at the um, American Academy in Rome. So we were, we were there for a month, which was really great. And I didn't spend that much time at the Academy because every morning I would go out at the crack of dawn with my telescoping pole and my camera and my tripod and just photograph all day. So um, it, was, it was a great way to spend Christmas and New Year's every sounds, year. Sounds wonderful, thank you. And uh, what soft skills can you recommend that a student develop as a designer to help their career? Soft skills? Soft skills, yeah. Like uncompute, like analog? Or um, as communication skills or uh, uh, communication. Collaborative, collaborative skills. Um, well, um, knowing how to speak correctly, I think is a good thing. I noticed that a lot of young people speak in the, the dialect of the region that they're from in the, in the US, which not everybody always understands or appreciates. So I think proper English would be number one on my list for that. Thank you. Let's go on through some of these. Uh, these are a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions, yeah. Um, where do you find many of the old type spec books and samples you use for your work? Well, I've been collecting them for a long time. Like most of the books I have, or most of my favorite books were found pre-internet. Um, so you just had to kind of know where to go. And, and also all of our trips to Europe were about that. Um, because when I first started, when I first started at Pantheon, there was, there were no reference books because Steve hadn't written them yet. 
but um, I used to just buy whatever books I could find whenever I went to Europe, you know, on poster design and, uh, and books on enamel signs, uh, type books. And, you know, now, of course, you can find them online for a lot more money, but at least you can find them if you know what you're looking for. Um, but um, so in a way, it's a lot easier. Like a friend of mine posted a, a book a friend of mine from London posted a, a, a book on uh, deco British typography that I had never seen before. And, you know, Steve and I both looked at it and thought, we, we should have that book, but we don't. So I went online, I found it right away in, in I don't know, somewhere in Oregon or something. And uh, it was delivered just like that. So that, that when it works that well, that's great. That, that is great. And this is the last question. And um, it's one and uh, it's, it's not a question. It, it's from Toby Fox. And uh, it's, Louise, you helped me revise my portfolio five years after graduating from SVA. And that revision launched my 30 plus year career in magazines. I wanted to say thank you for your generosity and guidance. Oh, oh isn't that nice? Well, you, you're very welcome. And good luck to the next 30 plus years. And Louise, that's a transition um, to thank you for your, um, your generosity and the amazing work you've done, the, um, the trail that you've blazed. And it's been a really great session and um, thank you from um, RIT and um, we're really appreciative of the time that you spent with us. Oh, well, thank you. And, and I really appreciate the time you spent with me and I loved the, uh, the presentation yesterday was very impressive. And I love my award and I love that you used Marseille with the dots over the eyes. I really appreciate that. I know where I'm gonna put it, in the studio. So that's another reason to go back. Nice, great. Thank you and um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, take care everybody and um, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.